homoerotic art. Not just his lips, but his entire body curled in distaste. A cavernous archway led into the upper living room, which ran the full length of the house, with furniture, lamps, mirrors, and further artwork dotted around as far as the eye could see. Everything was expensive, but I was more struck by how impersonal it was. It was all brand new, in perfect taste. I looked in vain for a discarded newspaper or a pair of muddy shoes that might suggest somebody actually lived there. It was somehow too silent for the centre of London. The whole place reminded me of a sarcophagus, as if the owner had deliberately filled it with the riches of a life he had left behind. And yet, when Raymond Clunes finally appeared, he was surprisingly ordinary. He was about fifty years old, dressed in a blue velvet jacket with a roll-neck jersey, poised with his legs crossed, so exactly in the centre of an oversized sofa that I wondered if the butler had taken out a tape measure before we arrived and marked out where he should sit. He was well built, with a shock of silver hair and humorous pale blue eyes. He seemed pleased to see us. Do sit down. He made a theatrical gesture, directing us to the seat opposite. Will you have some coffee? He didn't wait for an answer. Bruce, let's have some coffee for our guests, and bring up those truffles. Yes, sir. The butler backed away. We sat down. You'll hear about poor Diana. He hadn't waited for Hawthorne to ask a question. I can't tell you how shocked I am by what's happened. I knew her through the Globe. That was where we first met. And, of course, I've worked with her son, Damien, a very, very talented young boy. He was in my production of The Importance of Being Earnest at the Haymarket. It was a huge success. I always knew he'd go far. When the police told me what had happened, I couldn't believe it. Nobody in the world would have wanted to hurt Diana. She was one of those people who only brought goodness and kindness to everyone she met. You had lunch with her the day she died, Hawthorne said. At the Café Murano, yes. I saw her as she came out of the station. She waved to me across the road, and I thought it was all going to be fine, but once we sat down, I could tell at once it, she wasn't herself, poor thing. She was worried about her pussycat, Mr. Tibbs. <laughs> Isn't that a hilarious name for a cat? He'd gone missing, I said to her. Not to worry, he's probably gone off chasing mice, or whatever it is cats do. But I, I could see there was a lot on her mind. She couldn't stay long. She had a board meeting that afternoon. You say you were old friends, but as I understand it, you'd fallen out. Fallen out? Cloon sounded surprised. She lost money in a show of yours. Oh, for heaven's sake! Clunes dismissed the accusation with a flick of his fingers. You're talking about Moroccan nights. We didn't fall out. She was disappointed. Of course she was disappointed. We both were. I lost a great deal more money in that show than she did, I can assure you. But that's business. I mean, right now I've got money in Spider-Man, which is a complete total disaster between you and me, but at the same time I turned down the Book of Mormon. Sometimes you just get it wrong. She knew that. What was Moroccan Nights? I asked. A love story set in the Casbah. Two boys, a soldier and a terrorist. It had a wonderful score, and it was based on a very successful novel, but the audiences just didn't take to it. Maybe it was too violent, I don't know. Did you see it? No, I admitted. That's the trouble, nor did anyone else. Bruce came back carrying a tray with three tiny cups of coffee and a plate with four white chocolate truffles arranged in the pyramid. Is there anything you've ever done been successful? Hawthorne asked. Clunes was offended. Uh, look around you, Detective Inspector. Do you think I'd have a house like this if I hadn't backed a few winners in my time? I was one of the first investors in Cats, if you really want to know. And I've invested in every one of Andrew's musicals since then. Billy Elliot, Shrek, Daniel Radcliffe in Equus. I think I can say I've had more than my fair share of success. <laughs> Moroccan nights should have worked, but you can never tell. That's what being in musical theatre is all about. I can assure you of one thing, though, and that is Diana Cooper had no bad feelings towards me when we had to put up the notices. She knew what she was getting into, and at the end of the day, the money she invested was hardly substantial. Fifty grand. Well, that may be a great deal to you, Miss Hawthorne. It would be to a lot of people. But Diana could afford it. Otherwise, she wouldn't have gone ahead. There was a brief silence, and I saw Hawthorne examining the other man with those bright, unforgiving eyes. I was expecting him to say something offensive, but in fact his voice was measured as he asked, Did she tell you where she'd been that morning? Before lunch? Clunes blinked. No. She went to an undertaker's in South Kensington. She arranged her own funeral. 
Clunes had picked up one of the coffee cups and was holding it delicately in front of his face. He set it back down again. Really? You do surprise me. She didn't mention it at the Café Murano, Hawthorne asked. Of course she didn't mention it. If she'd mentioned it, I would have told you straight away. It's not something you'd forget, something like that. You say she had a lot in her mind. Did she talk to you about anything that was worrying her? Well, yes, there was one thing she mentioned. Clunes thought back for a moment. We were talking about money, and she mentioned that there was someone pestering her. It was all to do with that accident she had when she was living in Kent. That was just after we met. She ran over two children, I said. That's right. Clunes nodded at me. He picked up the coffee cup again and took a single sip, emptying it. It was ten years ago. She was living on her own after she'd lost her husband to cancer terribly sad. He was a dentist. He had a great many celebrity clients, and they had a lovely house right on the sea. She was living down there, and as it happened, Damien was with her when the accident took place. As I recall, he was between tours, or maybe he was doing that thing for the BBC. I really can't remember. Anyway, it absolutely wasn't her fault. There were two children. They were with their nanny, but they ran across the road to get an ice cream, just as she was coming round the corner. She couldn't stop in time. But that didn't stop the family blaming her. I actually had a long chat with the judge, and he was quite clear that Diana wasn't in any way responsible. Of course, she was terribly upset by the whole thing. She moved back to London shortly after that. And as far as I know, she never got behind the wheel of a car again. Well, can't blame her, can you? <laughs> the whole thing was a horrible experience. Did she tell you you had been pestering her? Hawthorne asked. Yes, she did. It was Alan Godwin, the father of the two boys. He'd been round to see her, making all sorts of demands. What did he want? He was asking her for money. I told her not to get involved. It had all happened a long time ago. It had nothing to do with her anymore. Did she mention that he'd written to her? I asked. Had he? Clunes looked into the mid-distance. No, I don't think so. She just said he'd been to see her, and she didn't know what to do. Wait a minute, Hawthorne cut in. You say you spoke to the judge. How did that happen? Oh, I know him. Nigel Weston's a friend of mine. He's also an investor. He put money into the musical version of La Cage Folle. He did very well out of it. So what you're saying to me, Mr. Clunes, is that Diana Cooper ran over and killed a child. She was an investor in your shows, and she was acquitted by a judge who was also an investor. Out of interest, had the two of them met? I don't know. Clunes seemed defensive. I don't think so. I hope you're not suggesting there was some sort of impropriety, Detective Inspector. Well, if there was, we'll find out. Is Mr. Weston married? I have no idea. Why do you ask? No reason. But Hawthorne was bristling as we went back down the stairs, and this time he didn't try to hide his disgust as we passed the Mapplethorpe. We left the house, walked around the corner, and he lit a cigarette. I watched him as he smoked furiously, refusing to look me in the eye. What's the matter? I asked eventually. He didn't answer. Hawthorne? He turned on me, his eyes vengeful. Do you think it's all right, do you? That bloody queer, sitting there, surrounded by all that porn. What? I was genuinely shocked, not by what he thought, I'd already guessed that, but by the way he'd expressed it. He pronounced queer, queer, making it sound like something alien as well as unpleasant. First of all, that wasn't porn, I said. Do you have any idea how much some of that stuff is worth? And secondly, you can't call him that. What? That word you used. Queer. He sneered at me. You don't think he was straight, do you? I don't think his sexuality is relevant, I said. Well, it might be, Tony. If him and his judge friend colluded to get Diana Cooper off the hook, is that why you asked if Weston was married? You think he's gay too? Wouldn't surprise me. That sort look after their own. I was having to measure my words carefully. I was aware that suddenly, without warning, everything had changed. What are you talking about? What do you mean by that sort? He can't talk like that. Nobody talks like that anymore. Well, maybe I do. He glared at me. I'm sure you've got lots of homosexual friends, you being a writer and working in TV, but speaking for myself, I don't like them. I think they're a load of pervs. 
And if I walk into someone's house and I see a great big cock in the wall and I found out they've got a pervy friend who put money into a pervy musical and who may have been persuaded to pervert the course of justice, then I'm going to speak my mind. Do you have a problem with that? Yes, I do have a problem with that, actually. A very big problem. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. When I had first met him, Hawthorne had made one or two snide comments about the actors who would be performing in Injustice, but for some reason it had never crossed my mind that he might be homophobic. And if that was what he was, there was no way I was going to write about him. He had said one thing that was true. I do have many close friends who are gay, and if I made a hero out of Hawthorne, if I gave any space to his opinions, they probably wouldn't stay friends for long. I realised that I could be in terrible trouble. What about the critics? They would tear the book apart. Suddenly, I saw my entire career disappearing down the plug hole. I walked away. Tony? Where are you going? He called after me. He sounded genuinely surprised. I'm getting the tube home, I said. I'll call you tomorrow. When I got to the end of the street, I glanced round. He was still standing there, watching me. He looked like an abandoned child. 7. Harrow on the Hill That night I went to the National Theatre with my wife. I had managed to get tickets for Danny Boyle's production of Frankenstein, but I am afraid I couldn't enjoy it. I wondered what Hawthorne would make of the actor Johnny Lee Miller, who spent the first twenty minutes running around the stage completely naked. We got home at about eleven-thirty, and my wife went straight to bed, but I sat up late into the night, worrying about the book. I hadn't talked to her about it. I knew what she would say. If I had sat down to write an original murder mystery story, I wouldn't have chosen anyone like Hawthorne as its main protagonist. I think the world has had quite enough of white, middle-aged, grumpy detectives, and I'd have tried to think up something more unusual. A blind detective, a drunk detective, an OCD detective, a psychic detective. They'd all been done, but how about a detective who was all four of those things? Actually, I'd have preferred a female detective, someone like Sarah Lund in The Killing. I'd have been much happier with someone who was younger, feistier, more independent, with or without the chunky jerseys. I'd also have given her a sense of humour. Hawthorne was undoubtedly clever. I'd been impressed by the way his mind worked when we were together at the house in Britannia Road, and he'd quickly been proved right about the cleaner and the stolen money, and, for that matter, the disappearing cat. Detective Inspector Meadows might not have been pleased to see him, but I had got the sense that there was a grudging respect, and someone high up in the Metropolitan Police clearly had a high opinion of him, too. You got a new puppy. I remembered how quickly it pinned me down, where I'd been, what I was doing. He was clever, all right. He might even be brilliant. The trouble was, I didn't like him very much, and that made the book almost impossible to write. The relationship between an author and his main protagonist is a very peculiar one. Take Alex Ryder, for example. I'd been writing about him for over ten years, and although I sometimes envied him, he never aged, everyone liked him, he had saved the world a dozen times, I was always fond of him and eager to get back to my desk to follow his adventures. Of course, he was my creation. I controlled him and made sure that I pressed all the right buttons for a young audience. He didn't smoke, he didn't swear, he didn't have a gun, and he certainly wasn't homophobic. That was what was preying on my mind, Hawthorne's reaction to Raymond Clunes. I really had been shocked by what he had said outside the house. I didn't even understand why he'd opened up to me in that way when he was so secretive about everything else. There are some people who argue that we are too sensitive these days that because we're so afraid of causing offence, we no longer engage in any serious sort of argument at all. But that's how it is. It's why political chat shows on television have become so very boring. There are narrow lines between which all public conversations have to take place, and even a single poorly chosen word can bring all sorts of trouble down on your head. I remember once that I was asked about gay marriage on a radio programme. This was at a time when a Christian husband and wife with a hotel in Cornwall had refused to give a room to a gay couple. I was careful. To begin with, I made it clear that I was 100% in favour of gay marriage and that I didn't agree with the hotel owners at all. However, having established that, I went on to say that we should try to understand their point of view, which was at least based on some sort of religious conviction, even if I didn't share it, and that perhaps they didn't deserve the hate mail and the death threats they had received. We need to tolerate intolerance. I thought that was a neat encapsulation of what I believed. It didn't prevent a torrent of abuse hitting my Twitter feed. A couple of teachers wrote to me to say that my books would never appear in their schools again. Someone else thought all my books should be burned. These days, 
the world sees things in black and white. So although it may be all right for a 21st century novelist to create a character who is homophobic, it will be much more sensible if that character is palpably vile, the villain of the piece. Sitting in my office, gazing out of the window at the red lights twinkling on the cranes that had sprung up all over Farringdon during the construction of Crossrail, I asked myself if I could continue working with Hawthorne. What had drawn me into this in the first place, and what possible benefit could I get from pursuing it any further? It would be much better to drop him now, before I was fully committed, and get on with other things. It was past midnight now, and I was getting tired. The Meaning of Treason by Rebecca West, the book I was supposed to be reading, lay face down next to my computer. I reached out and dragged it towards me. That was where I should be spending my time. The 1940s were so much safer. And that was when my phone pinged. I looked down at the screen. It was a text from Hawthorne. Unico Cafe, Harrow on the Hill, 9.30 a.m., breakfast. Harrow on the Hill was where the Godwins lived. He was telling me that that was where he was going next. I really wanted to know who had killed Diana Cooper. That was the truth of it. Like it or not, I was involved. I had stood in her living room, and I had got a sense of how she had lived and died. I had seen the stain on the carpet. I wanted to know who had sent her that letter and if it was the same person who had taken her cat. Hawthorne had told me that she knew she was going to die. How was that possible? And if it was the case, why hadn't she gone to the police? Most of all, I wanted to meet the Godwin family, and Jeremy Godwin in particular, the boy who was lacerated. One day I might come upon the solution to the mystery in a newspaper article. Hawthorne might even get someone else to write the book for him. But that wasn't good enough. I wanted to be there myself. It occurred to me that I could make up my own rules, who had said that I had to write down everything exactly as it happened. There was absolutely no need to mention what Hawthorne had said about Raymond Clunes. For that matter, I could remove any reference to the black-and-white photograph and the other artwork that had sparked the whole thing off. In fact, I could describe him in any way I wanted. There was nothing to stop me making him younger, wittier, softer, more charming. It was my book. He wouldn't read it until it was published, and by then it would be too late. He wouldn't care anyway, so long as it sold. At the same time, I knew I couldn't do it. Hawthorne had approached me, and he was what he was. If I changed him, it would be the first ripple in the pond, the start of a process that would shift everything back into the world of fiction. I could see myself reinventing all the people he spoke to, and all the different places he went. That bloody Robert Mapplethorpe would be the first to go. What then would be the point? I might just as well go back to what I always did and make up the whole thing. 9.30 a.m., Harrow on the Hill. I was still holding my phone, and I realised that there was only one way forward, although it would mean fundamentally changing the way I approached the book, and for that matter, my role in it. I didn't have to lie about Hawthorne, nor did I need to protect him. He could look after himself. But I would challenge some of his attitudes. In fact, it was my duty to do so. Otherwise, I'd be open to exactly the sort of criticism I feared. I had just learned that he had a problem with gay men. Well, without in any way condoning it, I would explore why he felt that way, and if as a result I came to understand him a little better, then surely nobody would complain. The book would be worthwhile. It might be that he was gay himself. After all, when high-ranking politicians or clergymen have publicly spoken out against homosexuality, they've often turned out to be deep inside their own closets. I didn't want to expose him. Despite everything, I had no desire at all to hurt him. But suddenly, I saw that I might have a purpose after all. I would investigate the investigator. I picked up my telephone and thumbed in three words. See you there. Then I went to bed. The Unico Café was just down the road from Harrow on the Hill Station, at the end of a dilapidated shopping parade near the railway line. Hawthorne had already ordered breakfast. Eggs, bacon, toast, and tea. It struck me that this was the first time I'd ever seen him sitting down with a proper meal. He ate warily, as if he was suspicious of what was in front of him, cutting with a fast motion and then forking the food into his mouth as quickly as possible to get rid of it. He didn't seem to take any pleasure in what he ate. I thought he might apologise for the way our last meeting had ended, but he just smiled at me. He wasn't at all surprised that I'd turned up. I don't suppose it had occurred to him that I wouldn't. I slid behind the table opposite him and ordered a bacon sandwich. "'How are you?' he asked. "'I'm all right.' 
If I sounded distant, he didn't notice. I've been doing a bit of work on the Godwin family, he said. He talked while he ate, but somehow the food didn't get in the way of the words. There was a notepad on the table next to him. The father is Alan Godwin, he went on. He's got his own business. He's an events organiser. His wife is Judith Godwin, works part-time for a kid's charity. They've only got the one son. Jeremy Godwin is eighteen now, brain damage. According to the doctors, he needs full-time care, but that could mean anything. Can't you even feel slightly sorry for them? I asked. He looked up from his plate, puzzled. What makes you think I don't? Just the way you're rattling off the facts. They've only got the one son. Of course they have. The other one was killed. And as for the one who's still alive, you're already suggesting that he might be faking it or something. I can see you got out of bed the wrong side. He drank some tea. I don't know anything about Jeremy Godwin, apart from what I've been told. But unless Diana Cooper made a mistake, it seems he may well have got out of his bed or out of his wheelchair and hiked down to Britannia Road on the night she died. And let's not forget that only yesterday you were the one who was in a hurry to get up here. You'd got them all banged to rights. Alan Godwin, Judith Godwin, and, if he was up to it, Jeremy Godwin. Correct me if I'm wrong. My bacon sandwich arrived. I didn't really feel like eating it. I'm just saying you could be a bit more sensitive about people. Is that why you're here? Because you want to put your arms around the suspects and hold them close? No, but you're here for the same reason as me. You want to know who killed Diana Cooper. If it was one of them, they'll be arrested. If it wasn't, we'll walk away and we'll never see them again. Either way, what we think about them, what we feel about them, doesn't make a sod of difference. He flipped over one of the pages. He had made the notes in handwriting that was very neat and precise, so small that I couldn't read it without my glasses. I've made a summary of the accident. If it won't upset you too much, an eight-year-old kid getting killed. Go on, I said. It's pretty much like Raymond Clunes told us. They were staying at the Royal Hotel in Deal, just the two brothers and a nanny, Mary O'Brien. They'd been on the beach all day, and they were on their way back when the kids ran across the road to get ice creams. The nanny got a bit of stick for that in court, but she swore the road was clear. She was wrong. They were halfway across when a car came round the corner and slammed into them. It missed the nanny by inches, killed one kid, hurt the other, then drove off. There was quite a crowd, plenty of witnesses. If Diana Cooper hadn't turned herself in a couple of hours later, she'd have been in serious shit. Do you think it was right she was acquitted? Hawthorne shrugged. He'd have to ask a brief. She knew the judge. She knew someone who knew the judge, not the same thing. He seemed to have forgotten that he'd been suggesting a gay conspiracy only the day before. Judges know lots of people, he added. Doesn't necessarily mean there was something nasty going on. We finished the breakfast in a moody silence. The waitress brought the bill. Hawthorne didn't look at it. He was expecting me to pay. That's another thing, I said. So far... I noticed that I've paid for every coffee and every taxi fare. If we're in this fifty-fifty, maybe we should split the expenses the same way. All right. He sounded genuinely surprised. I was already regretting what I'd said. It was more a reaction to what had happened the day before than a genuine desire to share the costs. I watched as he took out his wallet and produced a ten-pound note so limp and crumpled that but for the colour I would have been unsure of its denomination. He laid it on the table like an autumn leaf that's been fished out of the gutter. There were no other notes in his wallet, and even if my point had been justified, all I'd managed to do was to make myself seem petty and mean. That was just about the last time Hawthorne ever paid for anything, by the way. I never complained again. We walked together from the cafe. I actually know Harron Hill quite well. We filmed quite a few scenes of Foyle's Wall there, with the old-fashioned high street doubling as Hastings. It's amazing what a few seagulls added to the soundtrack can achieve. My first boarding school was nearby, and it struck me how little the area had changed in fifty years. It was still a slightly improbable enclave, very green and unworldly, rising above the other North London suburbs that sprawled around. So what did you get up to last night? I asked Hawthorne as we continued on our way. What? I just wondered what you did. Did you go out for dinner? Did you work on the case? He didn't answer, so I added, It's for the book. I had dinner, made some notes, went to bed. But what did he eat? Who did he go to bed with? Did he watch TV? Did he even own a TV? He wasn't going to tell me, 
and there wasn't time to ask. We had arrived at a Victorian house on Roxburgh Avenue, three stories high, built out of those dark red bricks that always make me think of Charles Dickens. It was set back from the main road, with a gravel path and a double garage, and from the very first sight it struck me that I had never seen a building that exuded a greater sense of misery. From the scrawny, half-wild garden, to the peeling paintwork, the window boxes with dead flowers, the blank, unlit windows. This was the home of the Godwins, or, at least, the three members of the family who had survived. 8. Damaged Goods One of my favourite screenwriters is Nigel Neal, the inventor of the eccentric Professor Quatermass. He wrote a chilling television play, The Stone Tape, which suggested that the very fabric of a house, the bricks and mortar, might be able to absorb and play back the various emotions, including the horrors, that it had witnessed. I was reminded of it as I entered the Godwin's home on Roxburgh Avenue. It was an expensive house. Any property of this size in Harrow on the Hill would have been worth a couple of million pounds. And yet the hall was cold, colder perhaps than it was outside, and poorly lit. It was crying out for redecoration. The carpets were a little threadbare, with too many stains. There was a sense of something in the air that might have been damp or dry rot, but was actually just misery, recorded and re-recorded, until the memory bank was full. The door had been opened by a woman in her fifties. She would have been about ten or fifteen years younger than Diana Cooper at the time of her death. She looked at us suspiciously, as if we had come to sell her something. In fact, her entire body language was defensive. This was Judith Godwin. I could easily imagine her working for a charity. She had a brittle quality, as if she needed charity herself, but knew that she would never get it. The tragedy that had changed her life was still with her. When she asked you for help or for money, it would always be personal. You're Hawthorne? she asked. It's very good to meet you. Hawthorne actually sounded as if he meant it and I saw that he had undergone another of his transformations. He had been hard with Andrea Kluvanek, coldly matter-of-fact with Raymond Clunes, but now it was a polite and accommodating Hawthorne who presented himself to Judith Godwin. Thank you for seeing us. Would you like to come into the kitchen? I'll make us some coffee. Hawthorne hadn't explained who I was, and nor did she seem interested. We followed her into a room on the other side of the stairs, the kitchen was warmer, but it was also drab and dated. It's funny how much white goods tell you about a house and its owners. The fridge would have been expensive when it was installed, but that was too long ago. The panels had a yellowy sheen, pockmarked with magnets and old post-it notes containing recipes, telephone numbers, emergency addresses. The oven was greasy, and the dishwasher worn out with overuse. There was a washing machine grinding slowly round, murky water lapping at the window. The room was clean and tidy, but it needed money spent on it. A Vimarana with mangy fur and a grey muzzle lay half asleep in the corner that thumped its tail as we came in. Hawthorne and I sat down at an uncomfortably large pine table, while Judith Godwin plucked a percolator out of the sink, washed it under the tap, and set about making coffee. She talked to us as she worked, I could see she was the sort of woman who never did just one thing at a time. You wanted to talk to me about Diana Cooper? I assume you've spoken to the police. Very briefly. She went to the fridge and took out a plastic carton of milk, sniffed it, dumped it on the counter. They telephoned me. They asked me if I'd seen her. And had you? She turned around, her eyes defiant. Not in ten years. Again, she busied herself, now putting biscuits on a plate. Why would I want to see her? Why would I want to go anywhere near her? Hawthorne shrugged. I wouldn't have thought you'd have been too sorry to hear she had died. Judith Godwin stopped what she was doing. Mr Hawthorne, who exactly did you say you were? I'm helping the police. This is a very delicate matter, and obviously there are all sorts of ramifications, so they called me in. You're a private detective. A consultant. And your friend? I'm working with him, I said. It was simple and true, and begged no further questions. 
Are you suggesting I killed her? Not at all. You're asking if I saw her. You're suggesting I'm glad she's dead. The kettle had boiled. She hurried over to flick it off. Well, on that second point, I am. She destroyed my life. She destroyed my family's life. One second behind the wheel of a car she shouldn't have been driving, and she killed my child and took everything away from me. I'm a Christian. I go to church. I've tried to forgive her. But I'd be lying to you if I said that I wasn't glad when I heard someone had murdered her. It may be a sin, and it may be wrong of me, but it's nothing less than she deserved. I watched her make the coffee in silence. She attacked the percolator, the mugs, and the milk jug, as if she was taking out her anger on them. She carried a tray over to the table and sat down opposite us. What else do you want to know? she demanded. I want to know everything you can tell us, Hawthorne said. Why don't you start with the accident? The accident? You're talking about what happened to my two sons in Deal. She smiled briefly, bitterly. It's such a simple word, isn't it? An accident. It's like when you spill the milk or bump into another car. I was in town when they rang me, and that's what they said. I'm afraid there's been an accident. And even then I thought that maybe something had happened at the house or at work. I didn't think that my Timmy was lying in the morgue, and that my other boy was never going to have a normal life. Why weren't you with them? I was at a conference. I was working for Shelter at the time, and there was a two-day event in Westminster. My husband was in Manchester on a business trip. She paused. We're not together anymore. You can blame that on the accident, too. It was half-term, and we decided to send the boys on a trip with their nanny. She took them to the coast to deal. The hotel had a special offer. That's the only reason we chose it. The boys couldn't have been more excited. Castles and beaches and tunnels up at Ramsgate. Timmy had a wonderful imagination. Everything in his life was an adventure. She poured three cups of coffee. She left us to add the sugar and the milk. Mary, the nanny, had been with us for just over a year, and she was absolutely wonderful. We trusted her completely. And although we went over and over what had happened, we never thought for a minute that it was her fault. The police and all the witnesses agreed. But she's still with us now. She looks after Jeremy. Yes. Judith let the word hang in the air. She felt responsible, she went on. When Jeremy finally came out of hospital, she found she couldn't leave him, and so she stayed. Another pause. She had to make an effort to revisit the past. The three of them had been on the beach. They'd been paddling. It was a nice day, but it wasn't warm enough to swim. The road runs right next to the beach. There's just a low seawall and a promenade. The children saw an ice cream shop, and although Mary shouted out to them, they ran across. I've never understood why they did that. They were only eight years old, but they usually had more sense. Even so, Mrs. Cooper should have been able to stop. She had plenty of time. But she wasn't wearing her glasses, and she just ploughed right into them. As we discovered later, she could barely see from one side of the road to the other. She shouldn't have been driving, and as a result, Timmy was killed immediately. Jeremy was flung into the air. He had terrible head injuries, but he survived. Mary wasn't hurt. She was very lucky. She had run forward to grab hold of the boys. The car missed her by inches. This all came out in the trial, Mr. Hawthorne. Mrs. Cooper didn't stop. Later on, she told the police that she had panicked. But you have to ask yourself what sort of woman does that, leaving two children in the road. She went home to her son. That's right. Damien Cooper. He's quite a well-known actor now, and he was staying with her at the time. The Crown lawyers said that she was trying to protect him, that she didn't want his name dragged into the press. If that's true, then the two of them were as bad as each other. Anyway, she turned herself in later that same day, but only because she had no choice. There were lots of witnesses, and she knew that her number plate had been seen. You'd have thought the judge would have taken that into consideration when it came to sentencing, but it didn't seem to make any difference. She walked free. She picked up the plate of biscuits and offered me one. No, thank you, I said, at the same time thinking how bizarre it was that she should manage to do something so homely, so banal, in the middle of such a conversation. 
but I guessed that was how she was. She had lived the last ten years in the shadow of what had happened in Deal until, for her, it had become the new normality. It was as if she had been locked up in a lunatic asylum for so long that she had forgotten she was actually mad. I know this is painful for you, Mrs. Godwin, Hawthorne said. But when exactly did you and your husband split up? It's not painful, Mr. Hawthorne. It's actually the opposite. I'm not sure I've felt anything since I answered the telephone that day. I think that's what this sort of thing does to you. You go to work, or you go to visit friends, or maybe you're having a lovely holiday and everything seems to be completely perfect, and then something like this happens and a sort of disbelief kicks in. I never actually believed it. Even when I was at Timmy's funeral, I kept on waiting for someone to tap me on the shoulder and tell me to wake up. You see, I had two gorgeous twins. The boys were just perfect in every way. I was happily married. Alan's business was going well. we just bought this house. The year before. You never realise how fragile everything is until it breaks. And that day it was all smashed. Alan and I blamed ourselves for not being there, for letting the boys go in the first place. He was on business in Manchester, I think I told you that. There had been a certain amount of strain between us. Any marriage is difficult, particularly when you're bringing up twins. But our marriage was never the same after we lost Timmy, and, although we got counselling, although we did everything we could, we had to face up to the truth, which was that it wasn't working anymore. He moved out just a few months ago, as a matter of fact. I don't think it's fair to say we split up, though. We just couldn't bear to be together. Can you tell me where I can find him? It might be useful to have a word. She scribbled on a sheet of paper and handed it to Hawthorne. This is his mobile number. You can call him if you want to. He's living in a flat in Victoria until we sell here. She stopped. She might not have meant to give us this information. Alan's business hasn't gone very well recently, she explained. We can't keep this house up, so we're putting it on the market. We only stayed here because of Jeremy. It's his home. Because of his injuries, we thought it was better for him to be somewhere he knew. Hawthorne nodded. I always knew when he was about to go on the attack. It was as if someone had waved a knife in front of his face, and I had seen it reflected for an instant in his eyes. You say you haven't seen Diana Cooper. Do you know if your husband approached her? He didn't tell me that he had. I can't imagine why he would. And you weren't anywhere near her home on Monday of last week? The day she died. I've already told you, no. Hawthorne rocked his head briefly from side to side. But you were in South Kensington. I'm sorry? You came out of South Kensington Station at about half past four in the afternoon. How do you know? I've been looking at the CCTV footage, Mrs. Godwin. Are you going to deny it? Of course I'm not going to deny it. Are you telling me that's where Diana Cooper lived? Hawthorne didn't answer. I had no idea. I thought she was still living in Kent. I went shopping on the King's Road. The estate agent wants me to buy a few things for the house to cheer it up. I went to some of the furniture shops. It didn't sound very likely to me. The house was run down, and it was obvious that Judith Godwin had no money. It was the reason she was selling. Did she really think a few expensive items of furniture would make any difference? Did your husband mention that he'd written to Mrs. Cooper? He wrote to her. I don't know anything about that. You'll have to ask him. What about Jeremy? She stiffened when Hawthorne spoke his name, and he went on quickly. You said that he lives with you? Yes. Could he have approached her? She thought for a moment, and I wondered if she was going to ask us to leave. But once again, she was calm, matter-of-fact. I'm sure you know that my son received severe injuries when he was eight years old, Mr. Hawthorne. The lacerations occurred in the temporal and occipital lobes of the brain, which control, respectively, memory, language, and emotions and vision. He's eighteen now, but he will never be able to have a normal life. He has a number of issues, which include short-term and working memory loss, aphasia, and limited concentration. He requires and receives full-time care. She paused. He does leave the house, but never on his own. Any suggestion that he might approach Mrs. Cooper to speak to her or to do her harm is as ridiculous as it is offensive. 
Nonetheless, Hawthorne said. Just before she was murdered, Mrs. Cooper sent a rather strange text message. If I understand her correctly, she claims to have seen your son. Then perhaps you haven't understood her correctly. She was fairly specific. Do you know where he was last Monday? Yes, of course I know where he was. He was upstairs. He's upstairs now. He doesn't often leave his room, and certainly never on his own. The door opened behind us, and a young woman came into the kitchen dressed in jeans and a loose-fitting jersey. I knew at once that this was Mary O'Brien. She somehow had the look and the manner of a nanny, with a sort of seriousness about her, thick arms crossed over her chest, a plump face, very straight black hair. She was about thirty-five, so would have been in her mid-twenties when the accident occurred. Oh, I'm sorry, Judith, she said. Her Irish accent was immediately distinctive. Oh, I didn't know you had company. That's all right, Mary. This is Mr. Hawthorne and... Uh... Anthony, I said. They're asking questions about Diana Cooper. Oh? Mary's face fell. Her eyes flicked back to the door. Perhaps she was wondering if she could leave. Perhaps she was wishing that she had never come in. They may want to talk to you about what happened in Deal. Mary nodded. Well, I'll tell you whatever it is you want to know, she said. Although heaven knows I've gone over it a thousand times. She sat down at the table. She'd lived here so long that she was on equal terms with Judith. She treated the house as her own. At the same time, though, Judith got up and moved to the other side of the room, and I wondered if, after all, there might be some tension between them. So how can I help you? Mary asked. You can tell us what happened that day, Hawthorne said. I know you've said it all before, but it may help us, hearing it from you. All right. Mary composed herself. Judith watched from the side. We'd come off the beach. I'd promised the boys they could have an ice cream before we went back to the hotel. We were staying at the Royal Hotel, which is just a short distance away. The boys had been told never to cross the road without holding my hand, and normally they never would have, but they were overtired. They weren't thinking straight. They saw the ice cream shop, and they got excited, and before I knew what had happened, they were running across. I ran after them, trying to grab them. At the same time, I saw the car coming, a blue Volkswagen. No, I, I was sure it would stop, but it didn't. Before I could reach them, the car had hit them. I saw t Timothy knocked to one side and Jeremy flying through the air. No, I was convinced he would be the worst hurt of the two. She glanced at her employer. I hate going over this in front of you, Judith. It's all right, Mary. They need to know. The car came screeching to a halt. It would have been about twenty yards further up the road. I was sure the driver was going to get out, but she didn't. Instead, she suddenly accelerated and drove off down the road. Did you actually see Mrs. Cooper behind the wheel? No, I only saw the back of her head. Even that didn't really register with me. I was in shock. Go on. There's not very much more to tell. A whole crowd of people seemed to appear from nowhere very quickly. There was a chemist's next to the ice cream shop, and the owner was the first to arrive. His name was Traverton. He was very helpful. How about the people from the ice cream shop? Hawthorne asked. It was closed, Judith said, and there was a bitter quality to her voice. Somehow it makes it even worse that the boys hadn't noticed, Mary agreed. The shop was closed anyway, but there was just a small sign in the door and they hadn't seen it. What having next? The police arrived, an ambulance came. They took us to hospital, all three of us. All I wanted to do was ask about the boys, but I wasn't their mother and they wouldn't tell me. I got them to call Judith and Alan. It was only when they finally got there that I found out. How long did it take the police to find Diana Cooper? Her son drove her to the police station in Deal two hours later. She'd never have got away with it. One of the witnesses had seen her registration number, so they knew who the car belonged to. Did you see her again? Mary nodded. I saw her at the trial. I didn't speak to her. And you haven't seen her since? No. Why would I want to? She's the last person in the world I'd want to see. Someone murdered her last week. Are you implying I did it? That's ridiculous. I didn't even know where she lived. I didn't believe her. 
It's easy enough to find anyone's address these days, and she was certainly hiding something. Looking to her more closely, I realised Mary O'Brien was more attractive than I'd first thought. There was a freshness about her, a lack of sophistication that made her very appealing. At the same time, though, I didn't trust her. I got the feeling that she wasn't telling us the whole truth. Mr. Hawthorne thinks that Jeremy might have visited that woman on his own, Judith Godwin said. That's completely impossible. He never goes anywhere on his own. Hawthorne wasn't even slightly phased. That may be the case. But you might as well know that just before she was murdered, Mrs. Cooper sent a rather strange text message which suggested she had seen him. He rounded on the nanny. Were the two of you here on Monday the 9th? Mary didn't hesitate. Yes? You didn't accompany Mrs. Godwin on her shopping trip to South Kensington? Jeremy hates shops. It's a nightmare buying him clothes. Why don't you talk to him? Judith suggested. Mary looked surprised. It's the easiest way to show them. Judith turned back to Hawthorne. You can ask him some questions if you want to, although I'd ask you to be a little more sensitive. He gets upset very easily. I was as surprised as the nanny, but I suppose it was the easiest way to get rid of us. Hawthorne nodded, and Judith took us up. The stairs creaked underneath our feet. The further up we went, the older and dowdier the house seemed to be. We reached the first floor and crossed a landing into what might once have been the master bedroom, with views out onto Roxborough Avenue. It had been given over to Jeremy, who had his bed-sitting room here. Judith knocked on the door and took us in without waiting for an answer. Jeremy, she said, there are two people here who want to see you. Who are they? The boy had his back to us. They're just friends of mine. They want to talk to you. Jeremy Godwin had been sitting in front of a computer when we came in. He was playing a game, Mortal Kombat, I think. Hearing him speak, it was immediately obvious that something was wrong. His words were half-formed, coming as if from the other side of a wall. He was overweight, with long black hair that he hadn't brushed, and wore baggy jeans and a thick, shapeless sweater. The bedroom was decorated with Everton football posters and an Everton quilt on the bed, which was a double. Everything was well looked after, but still seemed shabby, as if it had somehow been left behind. Jeremy came to the end of a level in his game and hit the pause button. As he turned to face us, I saw a round face, thick lips, a wispy beard around his cheeks. The brain damage was painfully evident in brown eyes, which showed no curiosity and simply didn't connect with us. I knew he was eighteen, but he looked older. Who are you? he asked. I'm Hawthorne. I'm a friend of your mum's. My mum doesn't have many friends. I'm sure that's not true. Hawthorne looked around him. You've got a nice room, Jeremy. It's not my room anymore. We're selling it. We'll find somewhere just as nice for you, Mary said. She'd brushed past us and sat down on the bed. I wish we didn't have to go. Do you want to ask him anything? Judith was standing by the door, anxious for us to be on our way. Do you go out a lot, Jeremy? Hawthorne asked. I couldn't see any point in the question. This young man would never be able to take himself off into the centre of London, nor did he seem to have a shred of aggression about him. The accident had taken that from him, along with the rest of his life. I go out sometimes, Jeremy replied. But not on your own, Mary added. Sometimes, he contradicted her. I went to see my dad. Ah, we put you in a taxi and he met you at the other end. Have you ever been to South Kensington? Hawthorne asked. I've been there lots of times. He doesn't know where it is, his mother said quietly. I couldn't stay here any more, and quietly backed away, for once taking the initiative. Hawthorne followed me out. Judith Godwin took the two of us downstairs. It's a credit to the nanny that she stayed with you, Hawthorne said. He sounded impressed, but I knew he was digging for more information. Mary was devoted to the boys, and after the accident she refused to leave. I've been glad to have her here. It's very important for Jeremy to have continuity. There was a coldness in her voice, and I was aware of something being unsaid. 
Will she stay with you when you move? We haven't discussed it. We reached the front door. She opened it. I'd prefer it if you didn't come back, she said. Jeremy hates disruption, and he finds strangers very difficult. I wanted you to see him, so you'd understand how he is. But we have nothing to do with what happened to Diana Cooper. The police clearly don't believe we're involved. We really have nothing more to say. Thank you, Hawthorne said. You've been very helpful. We left. The door closed behind us. The moment we were outside, Hawthorne took out a packet of cigarettes and lit one. I knew how he felt. I was glad to be out in the open air. Why didn't you show her the letter? I asked. What? He shook the match, extinguishing it. I was surprised that you didn't show her the letter that Diana Cooper received. The one you got from Andrea Klovanek. Maybe Judith wrote it, or her husband. She might have recognised the writing. He shrugged. His thoughts were elsewhere. That poor little sod, he muttered. It's a horrible thing to have happened, I said, and I meant it. My two sons insist on cycling in London. They often forget to put on their helmets, and I shout at them, but what can I do? They're in their late twenties. For me, Jeremy Godwin was the embodiment of a nightmare I tried not to have. I've got a son, Hawthorne said, abruptly, answering the question I'd put to him about twenty-four hours before. How old is he? Eleven. Hawthorne was upset, his thoughts elsewhere. But before I could ask anything more, he suddenly turned on me. And he doesn't read your fucking books. Pinching the cigarette between his fingers, he raised it to his lips, then walked away. I followed. As we went, something strange happened. Maybe it was some instinct, or maybe a movement caught my eye, but I realised that we were being watched. I turned round and looked at the house we had just left. Someone had been standing in the window of Jeremy Godwin's room, staring down at us. But before I could see who it was, they had backed away. 9. Star Power As we walked back to the tube station together, Hawthorne received a call on his mobile phone. He answered it, but didn't give his name. He just listened for about half a minute, and then rang off. We're going to Brick Lane, he said. Why? The prodigal son has returned. Damien Cooper is back in London. Must have been difficult for him, fitting it into his busy diary. His mum's been dead for over a week. I thought about what he had just said. Who was that? I asked. What? On the phone. What does it matter? I'd just be interested to know where you're getting your information. Hawthorne didn't answer, so I went on. You knew that Judith Godwin was at South Kensington Station. Someone gave you access to the CCTV footage. You also knew about Andrea Kluvanek's criminal record. For an ex-policeman, you seem to be remarkably well informed. He gave me the look that he did so well, as if I'd surprised and offended him at the same time. It's not important, he said. It is important. If I'm writing this book about you, I can't just have information being pulled out of thin air. Tell me you meet someone in a garage and we'll call him Deep Throat if you like. No, forget that. I need the truth. You've obviously got someone helping you. Who is it? We were walking through the village and passed a group of Harrow schoolboys wearing their uniform, blue jackets, ties, straw boaters. I wonder if they realise they look like complete wankers, Hawthorne said. They look fine and don't change the subject. All right, he frowned. It was my old DCI. I'm not going to give you his name. He wasn't too happy about what happened, the way I got blamed for what wasn't my fault. In fact, he knew it was a load of bollocks, and anyway, he needed me. I mean, you've met Meadows. If you added up the IQ of half the officers in the murder squad, you still wouldn't reach three figures. He brought me in as a consultant, and he's been using me ever since. How many of you are there, working for the police? There's only me, Hawthorne said. There are other consultants, but they don't get results. Total waste of time. He spoke without malice. Brick Lane, I said. Damien Cooper flew in yesterday, business class from L.A. His girlfriend is with him. Her name's Grace Lavelle. They've got a kid. He didn't mention he had a child. I mentioned he had a cocaine habit. From what I'm told, that matters to him more. He's also got a flattened brick lane, which is where we're heading now. We had passed Harrow School 
and headed back down the hill towards the station. I was beginning to worry about my role in all this. I was simply following Hawthorne around London, which reminded me that I wasn't feeling comfortable with the shape of the book. From Britannia Row to the funeral parlour, then South Acton, Marble Arch, Harrow on the Hill, and, next up, Brick Lane. It felt more like an A to Z of London than a murder mystery. I was annoyed that we seemed to have drawn a complete blank with Jeremy Godwin. Diana Cooper had texted that she had seen him, but there was no way he could have crossed the city on his own, certainly not to commit a violent and well-planned murder. But if he hadn't strangled her, who had? If I were in control of events, I would have introduced the killer by now, but I wasn't at all certain that we had met anyone yet who fitted the bill. There was something else preying on my mind. I hadn't mentioned any of this to my literary agent, who was confidently expecting me to turn up with an idea for the next book after The House of Silk. I knew I was going to have to confront her sooner or later, and I had a feeling she wouldn't be pleased. We took the tube to Brick Lane. We had to cross London all the way from west to east, and it would have taken forever in a taxi. The carriage was almost empty as we sat down, facing each other, and just as the doors slid shut, Hawthorne leant forward and asked, You got a title, yeah? A title? For the book. So he'd been thinking about it too. It's much too early, I told him. First of all, you've got to solve the crime. Then I'll have a better idea what I'm writing about. Don't you think of the title first? Not really, no. I've never found it easy coming up with titles. Almost 200,000 books are published in the UK every year, and although some of them will have the advantage of a well-known author attached, the vast majority have just two or three words on a surface measuring no more than six by nine inches to sell themselves. Titles have to be short, smart and meaningful, easy to read, easy to remember, and original. That's asking a lot. Many of the best titles are simply borrowed from elsewhere. Brave New World, The Grapes of Wrath, Of Mice and Men, Vanity Fair, all of these were drawn from other works. Agatha Christie used the Bible, Shakespeare, Tennyson, and even the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam for many of her eighty-two titles. For my money, nobody has beaten Ian Fleming. From Russia with Love, You Only Live Twice, Live and Let Die. His titles have passed into the English language, although even he didn't find it easy. Live and Let Die was almost published as The Undertaker's Wind. Moonraker was The Moonraker Secret, The Moonraker Plot, The Moonraker Plan, and even, for a short time, Mondays Are Hell while Goldfinger began life as the richest man in the world. I didn't have a title for my new book. I wasn't even sure I had a book. Hawthorne and I didn't speak for a long while. I let my thoughts wander as I watched the various stations rush past, Wembley Park, South Hampstead, and then Baker Street, its tiled walls picking out the silhouette of Sherlock Holmes. Now there was another master of the title, although Conan Doyle often had second thoughts too. Would a study in scarlet have struck such a chord if it had remained as a tangled skein? I was thinking of Hawthorne Investigates, Hawthorne said suddenly. I'm sorry? For the book. The carriage had got more crowded. He crossed over and sat next to me. The first one, anyway. I think all of them should have my name on the cover. It had never occurred to me that he was thinking of a series. I have to say... My blood ran cold. I don't like it, I said. Why not? I searched for a reason. It's a bit old-fashioned. Is it? Parker Pine investigates. That's Agatha Christie. Hetty Wainthrop investigates. It's been done before. Yeah, well, he nodded. I'll come up with something. No, you won't, I said. It's my book. I'll think of the title. It's got to be a good one, he said. To be honest with you, I don't much like The House of Silk. I'd forgotten I'd even mentioned it to him. The House of Silk is a great title, I exclaimed. It's a perfect title. It sounds like a Sherlock Holmes story, and it's what the whole plot is about. The publisher likes it so much, he's even going to put a white ribbon in the book. I'd been shouting above the roar of the train, but I suddenly realised we'd stopped. We were sitting in Euston Square. The other passengers were looking at me. No need to be touchy, mate. I'm just trying to help. The doors slid shut, and we were carried once again into the darkness. In fact, I already knew quite a bit about Damien Cooper. I googled him the night before. Generally, I avoid Wikipedia. It's very helpful if you know what you're looking for, but it contains so much misinformation that a writer trying to appear authoritative 
can all too easily fall flat on his face. More than that, I could imagine a successful actor doctoring his own entry, so preferred to look elsewhere. Fortunately, Damon had been the...